everybody for coming. Rick has, I, him and I have been, I've known him since at least 72. I think you heard his talk. That was just a year or two ago. And uh, <laughs> anyway, we've been competitive over the years. He used to shoot uh, recurve freestyle. Um, did you ever shoot compound? Oh. <laughs> okay, anyway, then when did you go bare bow? Uh, seven years ago. Okay. And he has really rocked the world, Berbo world, winning the world championships in Switzerland mm -hmm. and uh, in Berbo. So he's done, and he's posted a lot of good information in the Texas uh, Archery Association. I got an address I'll show you later. Okay. And uh, so he's got a tremendous amount of knowledge. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, uh. Yep. Thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> Other than actually competing, that's probably the, the most fun thing I have to do is uh, passing on information. Okay. Um, everybody knows Rick, and for you people that work under him, you need to take advantage of what he has to offer. Don't take it for granted. Take advantage of it, because very few people around the country is going to have that kind of knowledge. Uh, Many times at different tournaments, I sat down and chat with this guy. He knows about as much about archery as anybody. And uh, we pick each other's brains from time, but this guy knows a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, all right, let's get right into it. Okay. All right. I like to keep things a little bit simple. Okay. Can you see it? All right, consistency. Doing the same thing every time is just so important. One of the problems, though, is uh, archery was taken out of the Olympics in 1920 because they didn't have consistent rules around the world. It didn't come back in until 1972 in Munich, Germany. Doreen Wilber won the first gold. John Williams won the first gold for the men. John Williams is from Cranesville, Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania. He was probably at his height in 1972, and I was just kind of starting out. The few times that we did get to shoot together, he gave me a left-handed compliment. You know what a left-handed compliment is? That's saying two things at one time, like, for as short as this guy is, he's, he's still pretty sharp, okay? <laughs> or someone saying, wow, you don't look as stupid as you look, you know? Or you don't sound as stupid as you look. Well, John, that's what John told me one time, he says, that I was the most consistent shooter he ever saw that didn't have proper form, okay? That didn't sink in for a long, long time, okay? In 1974, I went to the World Field Championship in Yugoslavia, came within one point of the world title. I was consistent. I didn't have good form, but I was consistent. Also in 1974, when I came back, we went to Valley Forge for the Pennsylvania State Championship. I came within one point of breaking the world or tying the world record at 30 meters. I was consistent. Didn't have great form, but I was consistent. The following year in 73, the world record at 50 meters at the time was 322. That weekend at York, Pennsylvania, I shot a 323. Problem was, Steve Lieberman shot a 324 over in Europe at the World Target Championship. So we both broke the world record, and I got nothing to show for it. <laughs> I was consistent, didn't have good form. Nine years later, this guy here takes that record, and of course there was probably steps in between from 324 to 345. 50 meters on an 80 centimeter target, three. 45 is just, it's phenomenal, it's phenomenal. Well, it wasn't until 1987, I was at Texas A&M, and somebody I was dating there was doing a thesis, and she wanted to do it on muscles. I was 36 at the time, I had a few. The ones I have now are well hidden. And uh, she filmed me without a shirt, filmed me for about an hour at different angles, and we got to look at that tape, VHS tape, VHS tape, kids know what that is, VHS tape, and within 10 seconds I goes, oh, that's terrible, that is terrible, okay, so let's talk about form a little bit, 
Okay. Uh, I would like a volunteer. This yellow guy in the yellow shirt. Okay. All right. Get you to face the crowd and permission to mold you. All right. Put your arm out. Okay. I want you to look like a compound shooter just a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit like that. Come up here. Okay. Come on in a little bit. Now peek in a little bit like that. That's the kind of form I had a long, long time ago. I was consistent. Okay. That's the kind of form I have. Now, here's what the problem is. I'm going to, this guy is younger than I am. Not by much. He's a lot stronger than I am. Not by much. <laughs> but not as good looking as I am. <laughs> but there's time. Don't worry. He'll get there. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start pushing on this guy. Now, pretend I'm a bow, and I'm going to do this for two or three days. Okay? He is able to hold back. But why? Okay, relax. He's using all muscles. He's using all muscles. Thank you very much. I would like you, please. Okay. What, what's your name? Ryan. Ronnie. Ryan. Ryan. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? Hi. Can I mold you? Yes. Okay, I'd like to put your arm straight out. Okay. This is the classic T formation. Classic T. If you're right handed, if you're left handed. Kind of simple as that. Not always that simple. All right, pretend you're shooting. Okay, very good. Okay, keep your arm straight. Don't lock the arm. There's a difference between straightening and locking. You can feel it. If you try to lock that, you're going to feel it's going to get real tense in there. That's when you start using the muscles. Just relax it. You can keep it straight. All right, now I'm going to push on her like I was pushing on that gentleman over there. I'm going to push, I'm going to push, I'm going to push. And I could do this for a couple of days. And even though she's a little bit not as strong as I am, okay, relax. Thank you very much. What happened there is her bones are in line. She's using her skeleton. She doesn't have to use nearly as much muscle. Okay, so when you don't have improper form, you're going to fatigue. You're going to fatigue quite easily. For the recurve, Olympic recurve shooters, they have the advantage of what they call a draw check indicator, where they can keep, pretty much keep at their same draw all the way through the shot. Bear bow doesn't have that luxury. Okay? So for a bear bow to be able to maintain that, they have to have proper form. Okay? If they're not in line, and they start doing this, you're going to start getting some creeping real quick. Typically, a bare bow shooter doesn't shoot more than five seconds. Okay, You start getting past that, and you're going to start breaking down your form a little bit. Okay? Bow arm does three things. Two of them are good. Okay? They hold the bow up. They help you aim. That's all it does. The third one is bow arm movement. That's what we want to minimize, is the bow arm movement. So many times you pull up and you aim at the center, if you can aim at the center. I'm just talking about point on, where the point of the arrow is in the middle of the target. And we'll talk about string walking a little bit later. So if you put the point in the middle of the target, and all of a sudden you're ready to shoot, and it drifts out of the gold. Okay? What do you do? There's three things you can do. Now, I want to use Olympic recurve because this fellow here has probably in his book, but I've heard him talk about it many, many times. We're talking about a recurve Olympic right now. Pull up, got the sight in the middle, and just as the clicker went off, you drift it over in the eight ring. And what do you do? You take the shot. That's what he told me a long time ago. You take that shot. Make that the best eight you shot all day long. Okay? The other options are set it down and start over. Okay? For bear bow, it's usually a pretty good thing to do. Because what we don't want you to do is try to go back in. Okay? You're taking time, and we don't like 
throwing arrows in the middle, all right? It gets to be a habit. We don't like those kind of habits, okay? So, and a lot of things that happen with bare bow and recurve. I've seen this happen, the same thing with the recurve is, one of these days this is gonna break, is they get back and they get ready to shoot and they had second guess and they do that. I call that a hitch or a hiccup, okay? You have to set it down and start over, okay? A lot of my colleagues, and there's there's a couple more that was supposed to be here, they probably will come, is when they do that, they they take that shot, sometimes they keep on shooting, and they might get away with it four out of five times. But that fifth time, they're not gonna be happy where that arrow goes, okay? And there's times even in practice where I have a what I consider a perfect shot, and all of a sudden I decide, yeah, I'm gonna see if I can set that down, just as a drill, okay? Because the one thing we don't want to do is try to pull up, drift out, and drift back, okay? By that time, you're starting to get tired already. So we try not to do that, okay? Bow arm does very little, okay? Even in bare bow, a wrist sling, finger sling, is you gotta let go of it. Gotta let go of it or have a real light touch. Now, Usually the bow and bare bow won't jump out of your hand as much as it was with the Olympic recurve because Olympic recurve have, have stabilizers, sights, and everything to take the vibration out of the arrow, okay? That helps them minimize the torque. Bare bow has none of that. In fact, Olympic recurve can actually shoot a smaller arrow because the stabilizers take a lot of vibration out of the bow and you can shoot a smaller arrow, but with bare bow, that bear, that uh, arrow takes a lot of the vibration out, okay? Um, lost my train of thought there. Okay, so. Oh, another example when, with, with, with her, is a simple yardstick, even as flexible as it is, when you push straight down on it, it's just like the bone structure. It can take an awful lot of pressure, but you get something that starts bending like that. It's kind of like when your your form is not good and you have to use some muscle to correct it. So that's why we want to keep, try to keep it as straight as we can. Oh boy, here's the fun stuff. If you don't have a good release, none of these are going to work have to have a good release. Sir Isaac Newton had some laws of science and one of them was for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The way I like to relate that to archery is if you want that arrow to go straight that way, your release has to come straight back. Okay, try to come back as much as possible. Now, release is, is really difficult sometimes to, uh, Don Rabska, one time, wrote a paper. Don Rabska is a, is a technician. He's gone to half a dozen Olympics on part of uh, some big name company. And he knows about as much about archery as, as anybody. And I read something that he said one time. I've read a lot of this stuff. And one thing that jumped out at me was this, was this. It's very subtle. You might not get it right away. It's very subtle. The difference between, I'm gonna exaggerate this shot, of letting go of the string versus letting the string go, okay? There's enough energy in that bow that that string is gonna help you open the fingers, okay? So we don't have to do any of this, bam! stuff all right instead of letting go of the finger letting go of the string you know let the string go okay sounds kind of simple but it's something you need to think about there's lots of times i'll come up on the line when somebody's practicing and they're ready to shoot i put my hand just a couple of inches away from their hand they don't even know i'm there and bam they hit my hand 
and then he realized, uh-oh, uh-oh, need to work on that a little bit. Um, when I first, we started, first started shooting, it was 2015, they let Fairbo back in the national championship. We were shooting 60 meters at the time. 60 meters for 2015, 2016. And I had this simple Bubba tab at the time, and I couldn't reach 60 meters. I was aiming at the flag. And the way we always be teach beginners fair bow is finger in the corner of the mouth. That's where we start, okay? So there I was trying to get 60 meters, aiming at that flag. And this was a kind of a beginner's tab, and I kept getting the string caught underneath this little bit of a frame. So I went back to my treasure trove of equipment and found a dictone tab that I used to use for, for a recurve. So I thought, well, I'm going to try that. And when I tried to do this, I realized this little bit of a ledge fit a whole lot better if I was underneath the cheekbone, right underneath the cheekbone. And then all of a sudden, I was able to shoot 60 meters by aiming just a little bit above, a little bit above the target, or a little bit above the gold. Uh, and then the following year, they moved it down to 50 meters. So a lot of us don't have a whole lot of trouble reaching 50 meters with our bows. It's a challenge for others, and there's several things we can do where we can do with that. So after I took that, I took the same frame and made my own tab with a single piece. And then before I uh, retired from From Valero, I had one of the machinists cut me about six of these aluminum frames. And then I made my own cord of ant on the front and Bubba Bateman rubber on the back. And these things are just lasting me for years. Okay? So that's uh, kind of basically a little way to get started. The uh, When I was talking about, uh, oh, yeah. I like this kind of stuff. I like reading this kind of stuff. Okay, it just makes you think a little bit. Yeah. Can you read it from way back there? Yeah. 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 Okay. Pretty good stuff. Um, one of the things, like what Rick does and what I do, we uh, people always ask us, well, why do you do that? I said, well, we always like to pass stuff on. But Maya Angelou was a famous poet. She passed away a couple years ago. And the way we relate that to archery is nobody will remember how much he's won, how much I've won, how he shot, how we shot. But they'll remember how you make them feel, how you get them introduced to archery and things like that. Okay. This is the website if you want to go after the uh, tuning for bare bow or tuning for tens, okay? Okay, so would you, would you move that for me and just put that other target up for just a second? I'm going to see if I can demonstrate what I've been talking about. I remember a couple of years ago when I was still shooting recurve and I started shooting bare bow as I was doing three things at one time. Three things at one time. And it wasn't until one of the Lancaster archery seminars. Yeah, put that water bottle on top of your head. <laughs> that I watched Grayson shoot, and it made me think, because what I was doing at that time, I was doing three things at one time. I was bringing the bow up, drawing, and leaning my head. I was doing 
three motions at one time until I watched Grayson shoot at the Lancaster Classic. And I had one of them V8 moments and I told Joe, that's not the way I shot when I shot recurve. So we went upstairs and practiced and simply what I did was arm out, just like that. Two simple motions. Shot about 10 arrows and Joe said, how long is it gonna take you to get used to that? I goes, I got it. It was that quick. If anybody wants to watch the release from this side, they can come around, you can crawl around anywhere you want. Give me a one foot buffer, just one foot at least. Now, I'm gonna show you the difference between, do we wanna talk about string walking yet, right now? Oh, Anytime? All right, now, Anytime that you have your fingers up against the arrow, okay, that's called like trad shooting or traditional shooting. That's where you're going to get the most distance out of your bow if you're aiming point on. Now, with some of the lower 25 pound bows, probably not going to reach 30 and 50 meters unless you start aiming a little bit higher, okay? Now, when I mentioned underneath my cheekbone is where I like to shoot. When I shot recurve, I was underneath the jawline. So moving underneath the cheek line was a natural change for me, okay? What I like about it most is the finger in the corner of the mouth is okay, but look at the movement. There's a lot of movement right there. But boy, when I come up underneath that cheekbone, it's right there. It's pretty solid, okay? So string walking is this is up against the arrow, and the farther down the string you go, the lower you go. It's not like a sight, it's opposite of a sight. When the sight goes down, arrows go up, okay? So what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna start with my 20, 20 yard crawl, and we're gonna see what happens at seven steps. Okay. I actually expected to go higher than that. So I'm going to do my 25 meter crawl. Tell the viewers what it is. Pardon? Tell the viewers they probably can't see it. Okay. I know on, they don't see where the arrow gets. What about it? Oh. On film, they won't see that. Okay. Now can they? It's in the blue, high. Yeah. Okay. You want me to come over here instead? He's got the camera. Okay, there's a couple of different angles. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if I was to use my 25 meter crawl and was to aim at the center, it should go higher yet. Okay. That's string walking. So when we're out shooting field, depending on what distance we shoot, depends on where we we do it. Now, according to the rules, you're allowed to make marks on your string, or you can get tabs that already have indexes on it, like the Yoast tab. The Bateman tab also has marks, or you can put a piece of tape on and make your own marks, as long as all the marks are consistent. But you can't write on them. You can't put the distances down, okay? You can do that in the NFA, but you can't do that in World Archery. Okay, so now we're going to work our way down to, down to the bottom. So let's go down a little bit farther and see if we can find that spot. That looks pretty close. The couple things that I still work on is letting go of the bow. I have a very light touch. Sometimes I let go of it, sometimes I don't. But the touch is so light, I can get away with it. One of the students that I work with has a beautiful left hand that I, when I, when I work with her, I like to watch her because she doesn't hold on to it at all. So this time, I'm gonna see if I don't hold on to it at all. Relax the hand.
minimal, minimize head movement, like zero would be good. Zero would be good. Now, if this bow is properly tuned, this berry shaft should go pretty close. Pretty close. But the difference is, the difference is, yes, please. This bow right here is actually tuned for 50 meters right now. And what that means is, move that about right here. The difference between an indoor and outdoor tune, when I'm tuning for field, I'll do all my tuning at 20 to get, that's good, that's good. I'll do my, my tuning at 20. When I shoot out here, I actually do my tuning up here. Okay, the closer you get to the arrow is the optimal your bow performs. That's one of the difficult parts of tuning a bare bow is when you string walk, you're really kind of taking the dynamics out of the bow. So that's where we do the, the tiller adjustment. I don't know if we want to get into that, okay? I do a lot of tinkering, tinkering, I do a lot of experimenting, okay? So let's, has everybody seen these charts before? A lot of people, a lot of people, some, some elites don't like paper tuning. And they probably did it one time, the reason I like to do it, and the reason it's in my manual, and the manuals I wrote, I took from different publications over the years and tried to simplify it. It wasn't until within the last year I realized the Dick Tone was the one that did the, the plunger stuff a long time ago. It was called the French method. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I had to take and look at my manuals and I had to start putting credit for Dick in there, okay? So I usually like to start off at six or seven meters away, and this is what I call starting off. The reason I like this is so beginners can understand a little bit about how the arrow is flying, okay? So many times somebody else is setting their equipment up for them, and it takes a long time before they learn how to do stuff themselves. can come up and look and see what that does and you could tell me if it's weak if it's stiff if it's high or if it's low it'll be this one right here the best way is to look from the back side and you could see the paper as it rips can you see how it's ripping okay the point went in the bottom and the knock came out the top. So, a right-handed shooter, tell me two things, what happened? There's two things that happened there. It tore a little bit left, so look for left tear. Where's the left tear? Should be here, okay? And how about the knock? Is it a low knock or a high knock? Point went in the bottom. Point went in the bottom. And the knock came out the top. So that knock, that knocking point's too high. I need to move the knock down a little bit. Okay. But that's 20, that's 20 yards. That's not what my bow is set up for right now. It's set up for 50 meters. So I'm going to take a shot. I'll let you hold this. How's that? And I'm going to take another shot at my 50 meter setting and see if we have a different hole. 
Boy, I hope we do. <laughs> I got to make sure I don't aim too high or too low. Okay, let's see what that does. This one right here. What do you think? Huh? Yeah. Okay. What about the knock? Is it too high or too low? It would be a touch high. T touch high. Okay. The thing about I like about either bare bow or recurve, I don't mind a tad high. That assures me that the arrow is going to pass over without hitting anything. What I don't want is it to be too low because then it slams into it. Okay. I also don't mind in bare bow for it to be a tad stiff, okay? In recurve, I probably would like to do a bullet hole, okay? All right, let's try something else. Tom, uh, yep, uh, go ahead. So when you do paper tuning, you said you do it for indoor and outdoor? And yeah, I'm just got to remember, or there's a difference between 20 and 50. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I didn't hear the question. I didn't hear the question. Could you repeat I, the question? I'm just curious uh, when he's doing paper tuning, if it's indoor or outdoor, um, so what distances are you typically working with? Or? Well, this is a start. Keep in mind, this is just a start. In fact, what this does actually will help you pick the right arrow to start with. So many times, it's hard to find the right arrow for your bow. Okay, it's extremely difficult. All right, so sometimes if you're lucky and you got a pro shop that has different kinds of arrows, or you have somebody that has arrows, can I borrow your 720s? Can I borrow your 900s? And get an idea of what shaft you need to get to start off with. Because that's, that's the thing is trying to get the right shaft. All right, now, like I said, I just do this to get an idea. But what I will do, and if you read my tuning for bare bow or tuning for tens, your tuning comes from distance. Okay, 50 meters for a bare bow, 70 meters for recurve. You're shooting, and you're shooting a lot of arrows. And you'll take uh, the advantage to a, a biter, or yeah, a biter is turn it the whole, turn it a full clockwise, and start shooting a bunch of arrows. See if that group opened up or if it closed. Find out where your initial setting was and go the other direction and see where your group is. The advantage to Olympic recurve is once you get your group, then you can take your sight and you can move the group. Bare bow, moving the group, it's a little difficult. Okay, it's a little bit difficult. Too many times people think we can move the group with the plunger. We do it, but we're only talking a couple inches. If we're just a little bit left of center, you know, click, click, or a little too right of center, click, click. But you don't, you're not moving that arrow with the plunger, okay? Not moving the arrow with the plunger. Okay. Uh, to show you what will happen if you don't have the right arrow, Now, what's, what's interesting here is these arrows require a different knocking setup than other arrows. I could be as much as uh, three-eighths of an inch difference between different arrows. So these arrows, let's see what we have here. This is a, oh, this ought to be a good one. This is a this is a 600 with uh, this is a 600 with about 100 grains in it. Let's see what this does. This arrow should be too weak for my bow.
Okay, take a look at it. We need to start marking some of those error holes. Can we have a pen, a marker? Got a marker? Black magic marker would be nice. Okay, I'll borrow that. Okay. See which one it was? Should be that one right there. Okay. Gotta make sure. Let's see. Uh, magic marker over there. See how weak that is? That arrow was not for my bow. Okay. That arrow was not for my bow. That's for sure. And the only way you can get that arrow to work is if you cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, make it stiff. Then it could be too short. Here is a 500 shaft, but this has 156 grains in it. Let's see what that'll do. Okay, go ahead and take a look at that. Now that's a 500, which would be the right spine for my arrow, but that string of bow is not set up for that arrow at all. Not at all. That knock has to come down almost a half, or a half an inch. All right? And I want to tell you what, when it comes to, I like to start off with brass knock sets and kind of move them up, kind of move them down to where I get them where I want. And I want to tell you what, the difference of a knock set, high or low, make a huge difference in the way your error performs. You can even tell that by doing that. Now, that's just to get things started. You go ahead and set that over there. Thank you very much. That's just to get things started. And like I said, you can go out to 50 meters or 70 meters and shoot until you got groups. Every once in a while, fortunately for me, I hope I don't get these mixed up and shoot one of these tomorrow, <laughs> is at 50 meters, at 50 meters, my bear shafts will go into, into the center with the rest of my arrows. Okay. Sometimes they don't. But if my fletched arrows are going in the middle, kind of don't care where the bear shaft goes, okay? Because you can take and uh, get an optimal setup and do all that tweaking, and then for some reason you go in and do a paper tube test, and all of a sudden you shoot through the paper, and it's not a bullet hole anymore. So, you got your group downrange, that's all you was worried about, okay? Any, any questions on there? Or open. Go ahead. I have a, a bow that I'm shooting at 48 pounds, Oof. and I, I'm tuning it at 30, 30 yards. Okay. And I paper paper tuned it. Okay. Perfect bullet hole. Okay. And at, as I move back, I start bear shaft tune it, but at 30 yards, it tears high. I've moved the knock, and it, I cannot get the the bear shaft to knock hit high no matter what I do. And the only thing I can think of that might be bouncing off the rest. Is that a possibility? What kind of a bow? Oh boy. Is it uh, bow hunting type bow? It's it's for uh, traditional. Okay. It's a traditional bow. It's, uh, it's an ILS bow though. Okay. Sometimes those bows are hard to tune. You gotta really tinker with them. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you string walk with it or do you just tread shoot with it? Uh, Okay. All right. Well, if that bear shaft is going a little bit high, just move the knock point down a little bit. Well, I have, and it doesn't okay. seem to change much of anything. I've moved it a lot. And it doesn't really, it doesn't, it's, it's like this high, and it just it doesn't change anything. Just aim a little lower. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes? The uh, string walking. Yes. How much an effect does it have? Say you're at 50 meters and you're, how much will it move? If you move down like a, a thread, do you notice it? 
yes. Ten, twenty, thirty, four. This is my, this is my fifty meter field. Those are five meters in between each line. Okay, those are five meters in between each line. So, and there are times, and whether it's weather conditions or what, is somehow your errors are going a little bit high at a certain distance. Okay, I can still use that same mark, but then. I could take my thumbnail and either move it up or down just a couple of threads on that serving. And that'll move it up and down just a couple of inches. Okay. We can get fairly precise with it. Fairly precise. Now when you place your fingers on the tab, I've seen a lot of archers who get in there, they get everything all set, get their thumb set, get it close, and then they move their hand. <laughs> that you gotta be real careful of. Got to be real careful that you don't get some silicon or stuff, and that can happen. That can happen real, real easily. What I like to do is I like to pull it right up against the frame. I've seen a lot of people come out into here, and I don't know how they can measure it that far out. Okay, I like to start in here because it's going to relax out. If you could see where my crease is, that's where it's. That's where it's at when I'm shooting. It relaxed that much. But yeah, I like to come right in, put my thumbnail right on that mark, bring that tab down, boom, right there. But see, you moved your, your, your index finger as you did that. As you, you grabbed Oh, it. the finger? Yep. Is that okay? You know what? I looked at Simon Fairweathers, and he's got one that's got a rigid block on there, so your hand doesn't move. I tried that and it, it feels like it's, I'm gonna squeeze it right now. It feels like it's locked into place and it's really, to me, it's really uncomfortable. Okay, so. so you get there, now see how you moved your, your yeah. hand from yeah. the tab, I'm just curious. Yeah, the, well evidently, I get it in the same spot every time. Well, I know. I Consistency. Know. What I'm saying is, see, I'm trying to get the kids to learn, you know, is that critical or is it not critical? Well, you don't want to do this. Right. You don't want to do that. You've got to be able to see, I've always find that same spot. And there again, see, I don't know about, enough about bear but when you, you get your thumb on there, you watch them, they get all set, everything's good, and then you see the, right. even you do it, you, right. you move your hand okay. on the tab differently. Okay. And that's what freaks me out. Like, how, you, how are you getting that exactly what? right? Hang on just a second. I forgot to mention something earlier. We were talking about muscles. Uh, when I first started shooting, I shot off my fingertips because I figured the least amount of contact, the better. Darwin Kyle spotted that one time. And if you've got a a pen or pencil or even a thumb, take and grab your thumb just with the fingertips and start pulling on that. What I want you to do is look down and see how crooked your hand is. See how crooked your finger is because you're using muscles again. Now come into that first distal joint, okay, and do the same thing and look down, okay. So it's imperative that you come into that first knuckle. Don't be afraid to come in. A lot of people freak out a little bit when they come in. Oh, wow, that's, that's, that's deep. Not really. Not really deep, especially if your hand's straight. You certainly don't want to be shooting like this. That's almost shooting like this. Got some more Q&As down here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just real quick on, on the, the grabbing thing, Henry Park, which you, you know well. He's doing a seminar, and one of the guys asked him, because he's Korean and Korean national team coach guy, the guy who owns one of them, and he asked him, hey, you need to know the Korean secret. What's, when you grab that strand, is it 50% pressure here and 30% here? Firstly, 
must be 41 <laughs> percent. <laughs> and he gets up, he gets up on the stand, and he goes, "Hey, what's the I guess so. But he told me, yes, 50 percent, and there's 25 percent. Can you do that? Yeah. He say, and he goes, "No, just grab the string, just as perfect. Grab the string, just as perfect." And I think it translates a little bit probably with the tab. When you put the tab against the string first, and you find that spot, and then you move the tab to where it needs to be, yeah, when you get your fingers on that tab, of course, we've been shooting for a long time. That tab's kind of settled into our fingers. I have a very like, nice kind of round palace on the bottom of that finger, on the bottom of my tab leather. So I think when you when you get used to shooting more, and the kids then just, it can be a learning curve with them. But once you move that tab in place, and then you get your fingers on it, the tab is starting off in the right spot, and your fingers will kind of marry up to the tab the way they will naturally do it. Because again, his thing was however you, you grab it, you hook on that string, and that's perfect. Okay. And it is perfect because it's natural. You'll repeat what's natural. Okay. So Thank you. Okay. Um, when I was shooting off the fingertips, I had a lot of calluses, a lot of blisters. Once I came in, there they disappeared. They disappeared. One thing. You guys have in common with us in Texas is it gets hot out here. It gets real hot. You have a dry heat, we have a hot heat or moist heat. But how many people shoot with carbon arrows? Carbon arrows, carbon arrows. You really got to take care of your carbon arrows, okay? Can't leave them in the sun because that carbon will deteriorate. This is an arrow that's deteriorated over time. Go ahead, take a look at it. Go ahead. <laughs> That's a water hose from a uh, on your car. <laughs> More questions. Okay, you're using the top and bottom knocking point, correct? I have. Let's assume you do. Okay. Like okay. Top and bottom. We're talking. I'm talking field now. So you're okay. you're, you're crawling between 15, 20 feet and. Okay. Right. Well, you know. Right. Do you set that? Would you set that bottom knock knock set so that it's like if the average falls, so it doesn't pinch the knock? Do you have it really tight? Okay. That's a really good question because people have said to me over the years, "Why don't I have?" Two knock sets on there. Two knock sets drive me up the wall. Okay? Because if you get them too close together, you're going to find some really weird stuff. So I don't like the bottom knock. Is I just use dental floss sometimes, and until that knock just snaps on there, because it's not going anywhere. So I don't worry about that bottom knock. I don't have one. Okay. Now that'll last for a couple of tournaments, then it'll it'll start unraveling a little bit, and I'll put a new one on. But other question I had. Go ahead. When you when you're going in your grouping, yes. Find your different shots. Are you subconsciously or are you purposely lining your string, having your string alignment set? Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. All right. I avoided talking about string alignment for years until this left this couple of months ago, somebody started posting something. And sometimes I get kind of tired of these experts trying to help other people when it comes to that. They like to use the word string blur. Okay. A lot of people didn't understand exactly about string alignment. I know uh, Sabrina was one where I was working with her one day. She was shooting some great groups about six inches to the right. I was looking at her, her anchor and everything was good. She said, I don't know how to get them over. Okay, I said, well, don't go cranking that plunger over. That's not going to do it. So I said to her, all right, get the full draw, aim, but don't shoot because I'm going to ask you a question. She said, all right. She came to full draw. I said, where's your string? in relation to your your handle. She said, what? And most people said, can we talk about that? Go ahead. Yeah. Most people will say the same thing 
they don't know where this string is in relation to this. Maybe they're shooting and they're going in the middle and they never thought about it. But the ones that are going far left or far right, that's how we move our groups, is the string. Okay, and it's really not that difficult uh, because it's not that difficult. My string alignment is the same recurve as it is bare bow. My string is right here. It's right here. Of course, I shoot off to the side just a little bit. Not like even Olympic recurve, I was still off to the side. There was very few people that shot underneath. John Williams, classic. Vic Wonderly, classic. They come up underneath here. And I have asked a half a dozen or enough more Olympic recurve shooters, I asked them where their string is in relation to the sight, and it really surprised me that a lot of them, that string was off to the side of one of the sight. I'm going like, wow, to me, that gets in the road of my aiming. So when you're a little bit off to the side with bare bow, that's over here. That's completely out of my picture. Okay. And it wasn't that hard. If I pull up like this, and if my arrows are going off to the left, then I can move that string a little bit left, over to the left side, just a little bit, and it doesn't take much. See that? Didn't take much for me to do that. That'll bring the arrows over. Same way by going the other way. All right. A lot of people don't know about string alignment. Kind of was avoiding that for a long, long time because a little bit difficult. Do you know where your string alignment? Do you know where yours is? Do you know where yours is? If all these guys I work with should know where their string is. Okay. So, lots of different things to look at. The difficult with bare bow, I hesitated writing the manual for bear, tuning for bare bow because there were just too many variables, way too many, until Alan Eagleton's wife, she kind of battered her eyebrows at me one time and said, please write that manual. So I tried to keep it simple. And one of the things I said is, what I was showing in my manual is all basic stuff. You have to experiment. You have to go out and do this stuff. You have to experiment, okay? Now, for me, right here under the cheekbone is where I shoot. Now, you got somebody with a 20-pound bow that wants to shoot 50 meters, they may have to do this. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? That's to keep you from aiming at the cloud in the sky, okay? Another thing you can do, and I talked to somebody just the other day that she was aiming, she was only shooting 30 meters and she was using the shelf on the target. She was way up there. So I suggested to her to get a split finger, not necessarily like this one, but split finger, one above and two below. And that's gonna give you height. It's gonna give you a lot of height versus three underneath. So there's there's lots of ways to get that distance, okay? Just gotta work at it a little bit. What I don't like is face walking. And people that shoot field sometimes will face walk. Shorter distances are up here. If you look at Fawn Gerard, Fawn Gerard is way up here when she shoots indoors. But Fawn, Fawn Gerard will I shoot all of us <laughs> <laughs> indoors. Because she's way up here. Use a big arrow, heavy arrow, points. That's what a lot of people indoors like to shoot is big arrows, heavy arrows, okay? They avoid the small arrows indoors. But when you go outside, you can either string walk or the traditional archers, they're not allowed to move their hands away from the arrow. So their point aim might be 35, 40 yards. And if they go farther than that, they have to start aiming high or higher or lower or lower. Lots of, I think the trad, trad shooters and longbow shooters are pretty remarkable. I think those are the true archers, you know. We kind of took the sport and uh, set it up a few notches, okay?
Hey, Go ahead. I'm curious about weights. Weights. And what weights you're, you're going to limbo. Okay. How your bow kind of balances with those weights? Well, you're looking at a bow that was built for bare bow. This was built for bare bow. That was explain why I see a lot of bare bow shooters just get that, right? Well, uh, you have a Hoyt, right? He has a Hoyt. I got Hoyt. Right. Um, though a lot of the a lot of the bows are a little bit lighter. Most a lot of them were made for Olympic recurve, so I had to add weight to it. And one of the tricks was is where to put that weight. And it wasn't you didn't just pick it up and start shooting it. You played with those weights until you got it to where it was comfortable. Okay. This particular bow was basically made for bare bow because it had weights up above. Because up until they changed the rules this past year, you were, you couldn't add any weights above the grip. Now you can. Now you can. Okay. This particular one right here is six pounds. The whole thing is six pounds. If I was to put eight more ounces on it, it wouldn't work. Okay. This is only six ounces. I can shoot with or without this. Okay. But this bow, that's another CD. Um, now that you're able to add some weight to the top, that's going to help a lot of bare bow shooters because if you were watching while I was shooting, uh, the bow didn't tip back much. It kind of, it was kind of there. Where the, with the recurve, Olympic recurve, with the sights and the stabilizers, that bow jumps out and falls down. Okay. So now that the rule says you can put weights above the bear, those bare bows should be able to start performing a little bit better. Do you have anything on the top yet? No. Have you experimented with it yet? You're not going to. Right. Right. It's for those people that want to get better by getting equipment instead of working at it. Okay. We got, pardon? Like a CD riser? <laughs> well, now that you're allowed to put weights above, we think so. so. We think so. Why would it be buying the point to put it on a recurve Because they may not want to pay the price for that. Okay. Which is? Hmm? Which is? Twelve or fifteen hundred dollars. About twelve or thirteen hundred. Right. I mean. No, but there's nothing wrong with buying weights that below. The Correct. You're allowed to use them now, so. Put a weight up there. Put some weight up there. In fact, if I was still shooting my my backup bow is a Spigarelli. It's a really good bow. It's also a bow that was built for bare bow. If I was shooting Spigarelli, I would have a weight. Now that you're allowed, I'd have a weight on that upper one, and that would improve the performance of that that bow. Okay. Go ahead. Pardon? What is your killer on that one? One eighth negative. How much? One eighth negative. We have found, I think most people would agree. Is yours negative? 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 Yeah, that's what your problem is. Negative? <laughs> We've tinkered over the last five years. I've tinkered. I tinker a lot. I've gone from a quarter up, quarter down. And one eighth, sixteenth, three sixteenths, even even, even even will work, you know. But that's something that you really don't want to play around with, unless you got somebody that knows what they're doing, okay? Because I don't want drifting. Do you know people ask me that, and I don't know. I know it's a whole lot heavier than an all carbon arrow. Um, holding about 39.40 on the fingers. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I know what's on there. Okay. Not really. Uh, in fact, I got to find 
either get uh, my friend over there to make me strings, but Lancaster doesn't carry my 8125 brand. I mean, it, they, they still have that, but there was a string manufacturer from overseas that made strings, and when I get them for 10 or 12 bucks, I'm not about to spend the time to make a string. Simple as that. So now I can't get them anymore. So fortunately, I got like a dozen of them. So, and the only time they wear out is kind of like on the tips a little bit, sometimes a serving. I'll reserve them. As long as the main strands are hanging in, I just keep going. As far as the serving goes, uh, whatever serving is on there, um, I think it's a 19, and I, I have other serving. And that's what fits my G1 knocks, and that's what fits these knocks. But yeah, you can get different size serving to fit different knocks, but you get bigger serving, is heavier, all kinds of things. When you use dental floss? Yes. Is that uh, flat? Or it's flat. It's called uh, dental tape. Okay. It's flat. Yeah. I just use a little bit of it, just enough to, that then it, it won't slide on me. How far? How far? Just enough. Quarter inch? Just enough that I can do my normal tying. Okay. If I went just a little bit lower, I could use that as my 50 meter mark. But I can't. But I don't. Yeah. You don't want, that was, that was a question. That, that is a question somebody asks is how far down that serving can go because they wanted to fudge it down to where they could use it to, to, to aim with, which is kind of illegal. So I keep it up there, I just just enough, okay, just enough. So I still string walk at 50 meters, so I'm not using that bottom of that tape. That's like about 53 meters. So when you put a knot on and you move the arrow in a, a circle there, the string moves with the arrow? It's not uh, loose enough to... Yes, yeah, good questions. Yes, questions I never thought about. All right, let's see what happens. Yeah, it turns with Turns a little bit? Uh-huh. Okay, so it's on there pretty good. Okay. So you have a metal knot. Down below it, you have... Okay. Now, that metal knock is on there for a reason. If I take that metal knock off, and use a tie, that's gonna speed my bow up a little bit and make that arrow a little bit weak. This is for you guys, this is not for you. <laughs> huh? ah, that's immaterial, that's immaterial, a little bit. What did, Joe, what did you say that knock will slow down Four to six feet per second, that knock. So my bow right now is four to six feet per second slower than if I didn't have that knock on there. Okay, then my arrows will be a little bit weaker. What's okay. the equivalent of about uh, a pound draw weight? I, I, I don't know if it's that much. I don't know if it's that much. So you said if your arrow's a little weak, you can put a brass knock on there and then stiffen it up. So it's weak. My indoor arrows. Got that knock on there just for that reason. Because if I take it off, they're going to go weak on me. And I don't want to take the weight out to stiffen it back up again. Yeah, this is, this is. You got, you got a group really well, though, to, to notice that, wouldn't you? That's correct. That's correct. You're more likely to find that with a half decent recurve, Olympic recurve shooter. Okay. As far as bare bows, probably only a couple. A couple dozen people that really can notice that subtleness. Have you, you've tinkered. You've tinkered and you know nuances. Yeah, yeah. For Tillery, you have to reverse the lens, top and bottom? No, you get on the uh, Barebo website and you'll have all kinds of crazy stuff, yeah. I've heard people put a 36 pound on the up above and a 34 pound limb on the bottom. 
I don't even pay attention to those comments. I go on to the next one. <laughs> Rick, for having me out here, we're going to make you an honorary member of right. Texas Bearbow. It's the last one we have from our last order, so I don't know if it's going to fit or not. It's a medium, but if nothing else, it's just it's honorary. Well, thank you. Huh? <laughs> ah, he doesn't want my signature. <laughs> he doesn't want my signature. Almost enough to convince you to do bear though. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. At least it won't be a compound. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Just you and the other two kids. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I did have one more question. Thank you. How do you work with someone who has a hard time with letting go when they want to let go? In other words, sort of TP. Oh, boy. We have that all the time with certain kids. And um, Ben Rogers, he's got... Ben Rogers talks about TP, and his method is... Get in front of that target, get close, get close. Come to full draw, put it in the center and hold that for 10 seconds. If you feel comfortable, shoot it, go ahead and shoot it. If not, set it down. You can only do that about a dozen times, you're gonna get tired. And he said, do that for two weeks. And then try to start shooting, okay? He found that's a cure for it. When Abby was having that trouble, where they get up and boom, they let go of it, all right? One thing I like to do is tell them to take their camera out and take a picture for me. And they'll come up and they'll go like this. I said, well, that's not the way you shoot. If you took pictures the way you shoot, you'd go click like that, okay? You gotta hold that camera steady to take a picture. You gotta hold the bow steady to shoot it, all right? So force them to hold it. They don't have to shoot it. Force them to hold it. Either set it down or shoot it. Every once in a while in my backyard for a drill, I'll get maybe this far away, and just for the fun of it, I'll pull up and put the point inside the 10 ring and hold it as long as I can so it doesn't touch. I don't want it to wander to the 10 ring. If I can do that for five or six seconds, then I'll take a shot. I may do that no more than 10 or 12 times. Okay, because you can fatigue real quick. That's just a holding drill I like to work with. But I certainly don't hold it that long. You, you can see I didn't hold it all very long. Okay, people that hold it really, really long, really long, all kinds of things go squirrely. And you don't want to go too quick. You don't want to shoot really quick. And don't look at him. <laughs> Do you, do you normally pull up and aim, or I, I see some archers, they go up, 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 and then they shoot as they come by, or others come down, down, down. And okay, shoot. good, good. All right. Base, yeah, I'm getting there. That, that's my term. <laughs> uh, I'm basically, when I start out, I'm kind of pointing toward the target, and by the time I come in, it just kind of gets in there. All right. Now, for the first four or five years, I was snap shooting, what we call drive-by shooting. As soon as that point got in the yellow, boom, I shot. I got away with it for three or four years. Why? What was that magic word? I was consistent at it. Then it started to bother me last year because I was thinking when I was shooting recurve, I wasn't shooting like that. When I was shooting recurve with a sight, I put the sight in the middle or as near the middle I can, and then I had to wait, not long, the clicker to go off and shoot. I thought, why aren't I doing that with a bare bow? So what I started doing last year, sometimes I drift away from it and do that quick shot, but what I started doing last year was point in the center of the target, and as soon as it came into the yellow, I went, hold, wait, and then shoot and it slowed my shot down. 
You know how long that extra time took? About a half a second. But it was enough. It was enough. And I'll tell you, boy, it is a joy when you put the arrow in the gold and it's right there and you take that shot. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> you get a half a dozen of them a day, you know. And lots of times you end up get in there and you just kind of get in there and you take the shot anyway. But, yeah, that's a good question. I worked hard on it for about a year. Still working on it. Yeah. Field archery, uphill, downhill. How does that affect? You know, back in our day when we were shooting uh, aluminum arrows and Dacron strings, it did make a difference. I don't notice a whole lot with the stuff that we have these days, with the good bows and the, the good strings and the carbon arrows. I may aim just a little bit uphill and maybe take a little bit off downhill, but not a whole lot. It has to be really extreme, okay? So that's something you have to experiment on your own. You got some tricks on letting the string go? You were here earlier, right? Oh, uh, wait, I thought you were saying yes. I tell you, it's subtle. It's something you have to work on. For you who missed that earlier, it's real subtle. It's real subtle. Let go of the string. Let the string go. Something you got to work on. Something you got to work on. You got to get that released to come back. And I'll tell you what. <laughs> Good one. Okay. Okay. If you remember, sometimes, like we tell the Girl Scouts, sometimes, you know, you know, brush your hair, you know. Or try to get your earring, you know. And if you come back like that, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between letting go of it or letting it go. It's real subtle. Camera won't pick it up. I had a camera one time where it has a 12 second delay mirror where you can take a shot and look at it. And I knew when I had a release that wasn't good, camera won't catch it. The trained eye will. Camera won't catch it. Okay. Go ahead. Is your cheekbone the only contact that you have in your... Well, what's interesting about this, okay? When I settle in, it just so happens the back of my jawbone is sitting right there. I don't come back here and do this. Okay. It just happens when I come in here like this, it ends up there. That's why it's rock solid. And, and you just subconsciously set the, the in that jawbone, the jawbone and the joint. Cheekbone. Oh. Subcon so when you come in, you're not sort of settling at all. You're keeping the back tension the whole time so it came right to it, almost came in from underneath. What was interesting one time, years ago, I had a calcification deposit when I was shooting recurve. And when I came in like this, it hurt like crazy. I found out when I came in like this, it didn't hurt. Came in like this instead of come in like this. Proved the form a little bit because the form was a little bit more correct. How about the peanut gallery? You got any questions? He's not the only one. <laughs> He's not the only one. <laughs> I dropped down to senior to shoot with you. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Joe, or hand me those. Hand this out to some of the kids if they'd like one of our decals. Did we cover just about everything? Oh, exercises. Oh, exercises. I typically do push-ups in the morning. Uh, we go for a walk, about a three-mile walk every morning. Okay. Uh, but if you want to really build up your arms, if you want to build up your arms, you all eat potatoes, right? Okay. Your mom gets potatoes. Okay. All right. Take a one-pound potato sack and hold her at arm's length for like a minute. Try to do that for like a minute. Do that about a dozen times a day. And after about a week, you should be able to build up and get a two pound potato sack and start doing it, okay? After a week or so, build up to a five pound potato sack, all right? Sometimes you might only be able to hold it half as long. And when you start getting strong enough, then you can start adding potatoes to the sack. Okay. <laughs> did you find that when, when you went from uh, Asusa to Durban, uh, did you change your stance at all? Mm, probably not. You want to know how I got my stance on recurve? A military sharpshooter taught me this one time, is come up to full draw, put the sight on the center of the target, close your eyes, count to five or six, open your eyes, and see if you drifted left or right, and move your foot accordingly until you don't drift. Okay, because you got this kind of a springy, you know, some of these recurve shooters that, oh gosh. <laughs> You're winding up a spring. How do you prevent the spring from rubbing your nose or the side of your neck? <laughs> lots of times. Lots of times what happens there is somebody went like this. They turned right into the string. Lots of times that's why they're hitting their nose. You know, that's why I say, Always look down range, put it up, and bring it to here, and shouldn't have too much of a problem. Of course, I feel that on there like that, but I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't catch my nose, you know. That's yep. Well. Yep. And I, and I, and I think, and I think, what's his name, JD? The reason he has that Superman's tape is probably because he gets he gets really down in there. Now, he's a heck of a shooter with consistent shooter without good form. <laughs> but he gets away with it. If you get away with it, okay. But some of the prob some of the problem that sometimes is when you're not shooting good, you have to rely on your foundation to pull you through. So even those times where we might have one of those days that wasn't our best, but we still kept shooting because our foundation was strong enough that got us through. So never quit, never give up. You know, keep shooting, keep shooting. Okay. Yes. Just about everybody stretches. I got. Uh, I loosen up. You can use those those bands. You know, I loosen that up every once in a while. You know, don't normally like to shoot cold. Right. 
Right, right. Oh, the one thing I, didn't, I mentioned, when I shoot my backyard, I can shoot 25 meters in my backyard if I open up the gate to my neighbor. But typically, I got 20 meters in the backyard. When I step out on the porch, the shed is over there, the target is over there, and my shooting line is over there. So I always go over to the shooting line and I shoot all my arrows, blank bail. So I usually shoot about eight to 10 arrows, blank bail, just about every time I shoot. Then I put the target up and start shooting. Okay, so even, even I shoot blank bail. Because the thing about blank bail is, blank bail gives you perfect form. And then you put the target up and you wonder what happened. Okay, go back to blank bail. Okay. Um, I can always run into a newbie at a tournament where they're nervous, it's their first time, and I tell them, that yellow, for a beginner, that yellow is too, oh, I got oh, something I want to show you. I tell them that yellow is a little bit too, too small for you to aim at. Look how big that red is. Just shoot in the red for now, okay? Because sometimes if they try to focus on something too small, okay? The question, sometimes the question that people don't ask, can you bring that target over, please? Is people that shoot indoors, they shoot big fat arrows, okay? They wanna get a line cutter, okay? Problem with a big fat arrow is, do you know what lollipopping is? Okay, they can't put, they can't put the arrow in the center of the target because that's what happens. That's what it almost looks like when you're shooting a fat arrow indoors. They lollipop with a big arrow. When you have a regular, an arrow that's not as big, then you can actually put it in the center and you, you, get, you can see around it. That first year that I shot, I used my 2114s and I just barely had a little yellow halo, halo around that arrow. Okay, so you shoot a big fat arrow, can't do that. So they call lollipop, okay? And to answer that one question you had, there are times when I came, I set in and all of a sudden it just kind of, just, just below the nine ring, it just won't move. It just won't move. And I get a habit sometimes of shooting a nice group in that eight ring. I just hate that. <laughs> so when I start getting into a habit, I'll change habits during the day. If that starts habit, then I'll give it an extra meter. And if I get stuck down there, it's still gonna go in until it starts climbing and I get back to it. Um, for some odd reason, when I was, well, when I was shooting Olympic recurve, I had to shoot plastic veins on those X10s because anything lighter than that didn't work for my arrows. And lighter won't work for those arrows, even barebow. I have to have something a little bit heavier there. Okay, uh, spider veins are the new improved um, spin wings. We shot spin wings for years. Spin wings are great, high maintenance. Man, we were fixing them all the time. Spider a lot more durable, but the vein choice is just, it's just ridiculous how many veins are out there. When you shoot their shaft, you leave the base on your yeah, so yeah, I, I've got some uh, some two-inch veins that I used to have, and I just fletch three or four on there, and then I just cut them off so I have about the same weight on it. You can also take some of that shrink tubing. Back in our day, we used electrical tape, but shrink tubing, yeah. So it's not really a bare shaft; it's a simulated bare shaft. Uh, do you mean like you're aiming at the X? I'm aiming, well, I can't see the X anymore. I used, I could 20, 30 years ago. But are you aiming? I'm aiming in the center of the target. Center of the target? Center of the target. Okay, because I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, but I normally like to aim just below the nine ring. Okay. I like to see the yellow. Is okay. That, is 
Well, 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 how big an area are you shooting? Um, I mean, they're small enough that you could go in the center if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay. You're still lollipopping. That's fine. That's fine. That's quite fine. Yeah. Yeah. Quite fine. Go ahead. Do you ever use filler for anything besides tuning? Like, do you use it for a better hold pattern or anything? Maybe more in the Olympic world? But... You know what? I'm not too sure if I ever checked my tillers when I was shooting Olympic recurve. Don't even remember. Huh? One, two, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one piece bows. Uh, I don't even know what those tillers were to one piece bows. We you... tried to make them at eighth inch usually, but they could be almost a quarter sometimes. Qu positive or negative? Positive. Positive because we're up here. Yes. Okay, I didn't know that. Good, that's good information. Uh, when they started making the tiller adjustments, recurve Olympic. Most people didn't play with it in the beginning, but later on, there's somebody came up and said, wow, if you move your tiller a little bit, you could aim finer. Okay. Because a lot of times, if your tiller's a little bit off, it causes your bow to creep up a little bit or creep down, okay. and you're always using your heel or the top of your hand to keep it there without realizing you're doing it. Okay. So then you can adjust it, and all of a sudden, you can relax your bow hand. Okay. It just makes it easier. When you were shooting Olympic recurve, do you know what your tiller was? What about you? Both pause. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My best scores were five eighths. Five eighths positive. Is that right? Wow. Okay. Very good. I'll have to get my recurve back one time and measure it because I never, I never messed with him. Is there a tiller that reduces your stall? Oh. Mm, I don't think you want to mess with a tiller that much. You can really. It's going to bare bow stick with even eighth and leave it go and. Experiment with other stuff. All right. Don't go too crazy. All right. Thank you so much for having me here. Thanks, Rick. And that concludes our seminar. Thank you so much for coming, gang. Thank you.